Uh, Joe Nash is with me. I'm Matthew Ravel. Um, I should say that as well. Hello, Joe. How are you doing? I'm doing great, thanks. How are you? Yeah, I'm, I'm very well, actually. Thanks. Um, thank you very much for joining me. Whereabouts in the world are you right now? Well, as you can tell by my beautiful background, I'm in Amsterdam. Um, I have no idea if it looks like that outside right now, because I can't leave my house like everyone else. It is a shame, isn't it? Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much I'm in... for having me. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, sorry. I, I got distracted there by, uh, by audio problems. But anyway, so I'm in, I'm in Shropshire in England, uh, in case you're interested. And one of the things that we're going to do... Hey, Jeremy, hello on the chat. I understand from... Uh, watching Twitch streams, I'm meant to say hello to people who say hello on the chat, so there you go. Um, anyway, seriously, uh, what we're going to talk about is this whole streaming thing, um, which is uh, becoming more and more important right now that we're unable to travel, most of us, uh, during the, uh, the pandemic, um, and yet developer relations still goes on, and a lot of DevRel people are uh, turning to streaming, turning to video and other online content. And Joe, you are someone who's done quite a lot of streaming, as well as DevRel. Um, and today, I, I thought we should go through the basics of what you need to get set up and, and started. So, Joe, what, what's your... I want to hear two things, I suppose. One is, what's your um, technical kind of recommendations? But also, sure. what sort of content do you think works? So let's start with the, the yeah. technical side of things. What do you need to do? for the basics to get set up doing this? Sure. Um, so I think before I get into that, I want to talk a little bit about my background for streaming because I think that informs sure. technology choices a little bit. So one of the weird things, well, I guess not weird, one of the things that's very particular to video streaming at the moment is that uh, obviously a lot of the, I guess, state of the art and the techniques is driven by uh, the Twitch community, which means it's driven by gamers, basically. Um, so a lot of what you're going to be finding in terms of tooling and equipment is going to have all very gaming centric messages. So if you're looking for like, I guess, uh, kind of more tame language around video production, uh, you might sometimes struggle to find um, the tools or the equipment that you're looking for if you're not in the mind of the fact that they're probably trying to service the Twitch audience. So I'm going to be talking about a company called Elgato a lot, um, and they are a great example of this. They are um, a hardware company that just solely produces hardware for Twitch streamers. And they make really incredible products. Um, both me and Matthew are using Elgato products right now, I think, actually. Um, I'm literally surrounded by them. Um, and so I've become a bit of an Elgato fanboy. Um, but also on the software side, uh, a lot of the, and this site Matthew and I were talking about a little bit earlier, a lot of the more usable tools um, are now coming out of the needs of Twitch streamers. Um, so I guess I want to I preface with that. So I got into streaming because of gaming. Um, I am a Twitch affiliate, which is a fancy way of saying I have more than zero viewers. Uh, not at all that I have many viewers. Um, and so because of that, uh, I had a lot of the setup already, which has then been very helpful for video production work for some of the people I've worked for. So fundamentally, you basically need two things. You need OBS, um, open broadcast suite. Is that what it stands for? That's what it stands for. Um, it sounds OBS, right, doesn't it? Yeah, it sounds roughly in the ballpark. Uh, OBS and a decent camera and decent microphone. Um, and anything else than that, such as the green screen I am obviously using, um, as my hand goes out of my green screen, <laughs> such as uh, the green screen uh, and the lights and that kind of thing are all just kind of, they're nice to have, but they are things you can build up over time. And some of this some of the equipment that streamers use um, can be a little bit pricey. So if you're streaming at home with yourself and your company's not paying for this equipment, um, it's definitely a collection that you can build up over time. Um, so yeah, I guess we should start by talking about OBS. I think that makes sense. Cool, oh, awesome. Um, okay. So OBS Sorry. is basically a video production suite, I guess. Um, it's sole use isn't just streaming. It's uh, great for any kind of like managing multiple scenes and video like you can record uh, it's really good for if you're recording screencasts as well because you can have multiple scenes and hotkeys to change between them so you can have your code to open and then your slides and that kind of thing um and it's free and open source which is where we kind of get into the um the ease of use situations there are some kind of newer forks of obs that are being developed by companies streamlabs is one of them which is a version of OBS that's aimed at game streamers. Um, and basically all they've done is they've taken OBS and they've made uh, the UI a lot nicer, essentially, and a lot more usable. 
Um, so if you're kind of getting it for the first time and you aren't massively excited by twiddling the knobs and dials on video production software, um, starting off with Streamlabs is probably going to be uh, a far better way to get started. And if you are, especially if you're doing this individually, um, rather than as a company, um, Streamlabs has a lot of features built in to help you monetize your channel. So uh, obviously, particularly here on Twitch, people do this to make a, a livelihood. Um, and there are some ways that you can monetize on Twitch, such as donations, such as people subscribing. Um, and Streamlabs comes with a lot of kind of like neat toys out of the box for that. Um, but within OBS, um, there's a couple of things you're going to want to look at, particularly um, if you are guesting on stuff. So if you're not just producing the stream yourself, if you are going on, if you are speaking at conferences, if you are uh, using your camera in different places. So right now, though I'm on your Zoom, Matthew, and I'm actually a guest on, on your show, I have a green screen running and that's not using, for example, Zoom's virtual background. I'm actually sharing my camera from OBS. So on my on my machine right now, I have OBS running with a chroma key for this, uh, basically detecting my green screen. And then I'm sending OBS as a camera to Zoom. Um, so even if you're like joining other people's video feeds, you can, like dress up your own camera and just being a video production software, OBS has lots of features for filtering your audio and putting nice audio filters on your microphone or for making, adjusting the lighting on your camera. So even if you're not using a green screen, running your camera through OBS can help heighten the visuals a little bit. Um, however, as uh, some of the experiences we've had today, um, there is a big disparity between OBSs on different platforms. Um, and there's a couple of big gotchas. Um, the biggest gotcha is an audio one. So um, right now, for example, the situation we are in, um, Matthew is running uh, OBS and Zoom on his machine and OBS is taking the audio input, well, should be taking the audio from Zoom. So my microphone going into Zoom coming out on Matthew's machine, OBS should then pick that up. On Mac, OBS cannot capture the desktop audio. So on Windows, that would just work by default. Um, it would just catch, capture the sound and you're good to go. On Mac, it can't by default. You need another piece of software to provide that audio routing, to capture the audio from wherever it is you want the, the sound to be and to pipe that into um, OBS. So today we're using uh, Loopback by Rogue Amoeba, which um, I actually first encountered because I was using it to mix audio for my Dungeons and Dragons game. Uh, but it's also a fantastic tool for this kind of stuff. And this is what it's, what it's really made for. Uh, but there's also a couple of other free pieces of software around there. Um, so yeah, audio is definitely one of the big platform specific things. The other one is that whole virtual camera shindig I just spoke about. So that's enabled via a plugin called OBS Virtual Cam, which just makes an option available for OBS to output to a camera. And then in Zoom, you just select uh, your camera instead. So I can just go to Zoom and accidentally mute myself. I can go to Zoom right now and just change it to my normal camera and this would all disappear. But right now it's set to virtual cam. Um, that plugin is Windows only. Um, so you cannot do this on Mac easily. There is a piece of software called Cam Twist, which is one of those pieces of software that I'm sure it's fine and looks great, but like you go to the website and gives you like kind of weird spot web loops. <laughs> so uh, I will go for a like weird spyware vibes oh. like it's just like certain pieces of software you go to their website and it's just like oh i'm not putting that on my machine um and cam twist is one of those um <laughs> so uh there is a currently a solution to this in the works um the ceo of shopify toby i think it's toby uh recently put up a bounty um i think of fifteen thousand dollars for someone to make an equivalent of the virtual cam windows plugin for mac obs um, and that's well and well underway. If you go to the OBS GitHub right now, you can find the RFC that resulted from that bounty. And there's already a uh, downloadable proof of concept for it. It does require you to build OBS from source, um, but there is already a proof of concept there for it. So I guess the long and short of what I'm saying is um, this is kind of another net result of the background of streaming and what has pushed the state of the art in streaming, which is predominantly things that are better on Windows than they are on Mac. Gaming, video production. Well, video production is good on Mac. I don't know why that one's wrong. But yeah, gaming mainly. So OBS on Mac is a little bit of a worse, a harder situation than it is on Windows. Um, 
Is but it it's to still the point... great place to get signed. Go on. Oh, sorry, I was going to say, but for, for a lot of what we're doing in DevRel, it's probably, you're probably going to be totally fine with Mac, right? I mean, you might have to buy Loop back, which is $99. Yeah. Um, you might have to um, maybe, there are a couple of things you do differently. And also, as we've seen when we're setting up, maybe it crashes a bit on Mac. Yeah. But um, it's, it's holding up so far. Um, yeah. But like, if you if you want to have like a code window, like a terminal here, a web browser here, and you know Visual Studio Code here, and then your face hovering somewhere, you can do that, right, on a Mac? Yeah, yeah, that's totally doable. It just takes a little bit more setup and potentially more software, as like we know it. Um, but um, other than that, it's it's totally doable. The only other consideration, um, and this is going to vary depending on what your your product and what your code stream is is streaming uh, is a computational intensive task, especially on uh, the GPU side. Um, and there are reason, different reasons this matters. So um, first of all, it's just gonna slow your machine down. So uh, when you look at game streamers, for example, they will not play the game on the same machine that they are streaming from. They will have two machines, one which is their gaming machine, and they're piping the video output from that machine to a second machine, which is then the stream machine. Um, so if you are streaming something which is computationally intensive, I don't know, maybe you're the, the most everyday example I can think of where this would matter is like maybe you're live streaming a big code base of a compiled language and it actually makes a material difference to how fast it compiles. I don't know. But more, I guess there's other things where like you're doing machine learning stuff, which is using the GPU um, to run models and maybe that could be impacted by the stream. Um, but just in general, be aware that like if it's the same machine you're streaming on, you are going to see a reduction in performance. Um, if you do decide to go down the route of like, oh, hey, I've got two laptops, so I want to stream from one to the other, um, it's actually super easy. We're, this is more of a hardware thing, but we can get onto that in a minute. Um, super easy thanks to companies like Nelgato who make little hardware devices. This little cute thing. Um, this is the HD60S stream card. HDMI on one end, HDMI on the other end. You just, it will make video output go between machines so you can stream on a different computer so as long as you've got a machine somewhere and you've got a machine with a hdmi output uh you can use a, a dual machine setup um the other reason probably the more important reason it matters is your audio quality uh particularly if you don't have a good mic and if you aren't quite sure how to filter audio or you find that difficult um because if you do run this on one machine alongside your VS Code and what all the other Electron apps I'm sure you're running, that fan is going to kick in and that should come through on the stream pretty easily. Um, so that's the other compelling reason to um, get the, the stream tool on a different on a different machine. Um, but yeah, functionally, especially if your first like attempts at it, it's it's totally fine. Cool, thanks. Um, so are we okay to move on to hardware? Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, because I know we're going to do Tamo and George Castro are going to do a big uh, OBS session next week. Um, Great, cool. So, I mean, it's good to cover it now, but, you know, let's... Uh, yeah, no, it's awesome. So in terms of hardware, like you mentioned microphones and so on, you mentioned the like, the Elgato light that I've got up there. Um, yeah. I've got the stream got card thingy. Um, so let me let me turn off the light and, and show you the cool. difference, right? Oh, actually, I've got to be fun. So... If I turn off the light, it's probably going to be like green screen. It's not too much different but you can see it looks it looks worse yeah yep. and, okay so and then here's the thing right so i've webcams logitech right. c922 i think or c920 yeah. c920 this is like, yeah this is the the, the camera right but yeah. on the mac it looks terrible by default um interesting so let let me go on to just the default settings and you will see that there's not only does it pick up the flicker from my lights above my LED lights because it's set up for uh, American uh, frequencies instead of uh, European, but also right. it it just looks really washed out. So yeah, and also it's it, it's not zoomed. So like that. Yeah, there's that. So you see all the junk. You see my printer. You see my curtain. Yeah. stuff like that. But there's this other thing as well, which backlight compensation, which just yeah, again washes just it out a bit. Washes more. it out. Yeah. 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 So, so I, there's, I guess this is like 
I think what you're hitting on is like something that's really key to kind of also what we've spoken about so far, which is like there is a kind of weird set, and actually it's very key to what someone just said in the chat. There is a kind of default accepted set of hardware tools now that everyone uses. So the Logitech C920 webcam is like the one that gets recommended. Um, OBS is the software that gets recommended. Uh, the microphone I'm using, which is a Yeti Blue, um, or Blue Yeti, I think Yeti Blue, is like one of the best microphones. But as has been observed, uh, I did nothing with my audio setup before joining this um, this live stream today. I just set the I just set the microphone up and hit it. Uh, and it probably sounds not great because even when you have the best hardware uh, for the job, um, it still needs, especially when it comes to audio and video, they still need to be adjusted for your particular surroundings. So lighting's a, a, a great one where like, I'm in a dimly lit room with one window. Um, if I don't have this light on, I'm gonna look pretty terrible, but more importantly, I'm using a green screen. If I don't have my key light, for your, for your setting, the light right now is like purely just to make things look a little bit better, right? Whereas if I don't properly light my green screen, it just full on won't function. Um, and with my audio, this is a pretty big room and I don't have any dampening or anything around me. So I'm gonna be picking up a bit of an echo, especially cause I'm trying to hide the microphone and don't have it directly in front of my face, right? Um, so having configurable hardware and software um, is one of the great things. And Logitech with that camera in particular, do you have the, the Logi app? I do, but I, I bought uh, something called Webcam Settings Panel out of the Mac App Store, and that that's given me so much more access to settings on the camera, which I think are available by default on Windows. But yeah, because yeah, I, I was asking people, why why do people recommend the C920 camera. when it's so terrible? Right. And what I didn't realize was <laughs> that actually the default settings are terrible. Um, right. And actually on mine, mine's giving a great showcase right now. One of the default settings on the C920 is autofocus and it will like do weird things occasionally and just go out of focus if I move in a particular way. Um, and this is like with my setup, it's all a bit out of whack because I haven't done anything for a while. And even every time I like, like for this, it's been a week since I live streamed. Um, and it still took me half an hour to set up the green screen. Um, but like things like audio and video setup, like once you've got it tuned, the way that you know works with your room and you're doing it like repetitively, um, you'll it'll it will get better over time for sure. Um <laughs> sorry, I was reading the comments out the sound. Um I'm not actually shouting, Bayo. This is just how loud I normally talk. I'm so sorry. Um, but yes, a directional microphone is a good shout. So the reason I have an omnidirectional microphone, um, again, this comes down to the background of what I was kind of saying, which is um uh, I don't just like, I'm not just usually sitting at my desk, uh, looking at a screen when I stream, like sometimes I'm playing games in particular, my, my old game live stream had a lot of VR. Um, and so I'm not always directly in front of my mic, which is why I have an omnidirectional mic. Um, and also I use this mic for recording multiple people speaking at the same time. So again, to go to the other non-technical example, um, when we play Dungeons and Dragons, sometimes we record and we use this microphone. So that's why I have an omnidirectional mic. Um, but if you know that you are going to be in a fairly fixed setup, a, uh, a directional microphone or even like a lapel microphone or like even a decent gaming headset that has a good microphone um, are totally valid choices. Um, but you're, you're, I made this you particular got... choice though. Sorry. Sorry. I was saying, if you've got the Blue Yeti, you can set it to the cardioid setting, which you can, is yeah. then directional, which is what I'm using now um which is that setting i don't know if that made any material difference to uh how i sound then, right now but then you've got you've also got the the logitech g hub where and the blue hub as well where you can you can change the audio filtering um yeah. it's one of the reasons i got this because i've got a mixing desk with a, an xlr mic and i thought i don't want to get that out every time so having yeah, the software yeah. audio is, is great yeah, and it's all you can do that. Um, you can mix the audio as well in uh, OBS. Um, and I used to have um, a bunch of like filters and whatever for this microphone in particular uh, set up on OBS, which I don't have in the scene I'm currently using right now. I'm talking to you through Zoom anyway, so I wouldn't have it. Um, Jeremy just made a good point about the cameras, which is he has the Logitech Stream Cam, and it's a marked improvement from the series we've been talking about. Um, okay. This uh, the C920 series is like a really old series of webcams now like they've kind of like i like guess they're still making new models on it yeah um but yeah they they seem to be staples but i'm sure there's more advanced things out there um 
So what? Charlie asks about um, kind of sound dampening, and yeah. I'm not really a tapestry person, so I'm not going to get a tapestry on the wall in front of me, right? Yeah. Um, but also, I don't want to stick egg boxes up or whatever, because this is a working office. You know, it's not. Right, right, right. I don't right. have a studio as such. Um, yeah. Do you have any recommendations? I mean, do, do you have bits of material hanging up or foam or something? Yeah. Like um, so this is actually one of the, the benefits of like, this is a kind of dual benefit of having a green screen. Is that like, it's already reduced, it's cut this room in half for me right now. It's considerably more echoey when I'm not using my green screen. Um, and then other than that, um, changing your mic type. So lapel mics um, are perfectly fine. I cannot use the lapel mic thanks to the volume of my beard. Um, it, it's a bit of a problem when you're at a desk and you keep whacking your lapel mic. Um, but yeah, changing the mic type is a is a great one. Um, and yeah, especially like I'm in a rental situation, so I also can't stick sound dampening panels all over the walls. Um, so yeah, it's a bit of a tricky one. Uh, one of the things that um, I've seen people do, which I'm still not sure uh, whether it's extreme or not. So um, this is a type of hardware we haven't spoken about. Everything on my desk is on an arm. So this is on a microphone arm. My monitor's on an arm. Um, and the reason for the monitor is a lighting thing, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but uh, I have seen people make tents across their arms. So like my monitor arm is here, my microphone arm is there, and just draping a blanket between those two to kind of box it all in is something that I have seen done. Uh, you look slightly uh, unhinged, <laughs> it definitely works. Um, so yeah, the, the arm thing actually, while I'm on that, um, one of the uh, having movable things um, for your lighting setup and your sound setup is really useful. Um, in particular, sometimes, and it's not happening today, I don't know why, sometimes uh, my monitor picks up the reflection of my green screen. So the green shines off my monitor and then see this little light patch on my forehead. Sometimes that will be particularly shiny and will catch the reflection of my monitor. And so my forehead will become a green screen and I will get a big hole in my face. Um, and so when that happens, it's great to just be able to push my monitor away a bit um, or adjust the angle of it um, and that kind of thing. Um, the positioning of your webcam is also super useful. So having that webcam on an arm. Um, so right now my arm is positioned right above my screen. So if I was doing like a coding live stream, I'd always kind of be looking roughly where the audience, uh, I guess, is. Um, so having movable components is also super great. Um, lots of coders now are using ultra wides as the new fad. Uh, that are like monitor arms for ultra wides is terrifying because these are big monitors and these arms do not look like they can hack it. Um, Dell have the Dell monitor arm. They uh, do not actually uh, officially like assign their ultra wide models to that monitor arm. But if you go to any Dell showrooms or you go to a Dell booth at a conference, they will be using that monitor arm for their monitors. And that's what I'm using. And it's big enough. I've got one of the big thick Dells, not as nice as the Samsung ones. So if you've got a Visa compatible big monitor, uh, I'd recommend the Dell monitor arm. It does seem to cope with it. Okay. Nice. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I, so uh, Laurent and Jeremy mentioned bath towels and going into closets and stuff like that. You, so yeah. If you're doing audio only work, you can buy uh, booths, sound booths. Um, and one thing I'm probably going to do is is put a blanket down on on the desk because that will, you know, that refracts some sound, certainly. Yeah. Um, but I think if I'm for audio work, it'd be good to, you know, if no one's seeing you, you can stick your head in a box. Um, yeah. It's not yeah. so good for this sort of situation. So uh, I'm just replying to people. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah also I don't, I don't know if you can can you hear this keyboard yeah yeah cool mechanical keyboards for live streams terrible idea <laughs> put away your mechanical keyboard get out your soft bluetooth one far better <laughs> so um all right we've spoken a bit about hardware and stuff like that um one of the things that i think is really important is is the actual content clearly you know it's it's Fine. Oh, Bayo mentions the RTX, which you were yeah, talking so about earlier. Let's talk about that. Bayo, I, I have that. I've, I've, okay. So background on this, um, Nvidia made some new graphics cards, RTX. Um, they, the difference between them and the previous graphics cards is they have these special cores for AI, basically. Other than that, the performance is basically identical to like the 1080 Ti range, essentially. Um, 
they are desperate to sell these very, very, very expensive graphics cards whose price will blow out the rest of your computer. Very desperate to sell these graphics cards. Uh, so they've started to release apps that use them. So they've just released this app called RTX Voice, um, which is, uh, it uses AI and it uses the cores on this graphics card to um, noise, to like automatically suppress background noise. And there is this wild video of a Twitch streamer um, who is sitting like I am now with one of those like big desktop fans. In fact, I've got one here with like one of these like at his face on whilst banging a hammer on the desk and you can't hear anything but his voice crystal clear. It is wild. Um, so it transpires uh, that that app is actually usable if you don't have an RTX graphics card. So the older NVIDIA chips still have uh, like processing cores on them that aren't for graphics that they have CUDA cores um, and the CUDA cores will attempt to run the RTX audio package. Um, all you have to do is when you install, when you go to install RTX Audio, um, it will it will say it can't install, but it will unpack all the files. So you then just go into the files and you <laughs> you open a particular file and remove a section which basically says don't install, and then you rerun the installer and it works. So I have done that. Let me change to the RTX Audio. Oh, I'm on the RTX Audio. I'm actually on the RTX Audio now. So in theory, this should be background dampened. I, it doesn't seem to work very well for me. And that's probably because I'm on a laptop that has an NVIDIA GPU, but it's not a super great one. Um, so I think your mileage will vary. But um, yeah, it is really interesting. Um, like if you've, got an, if you've got a machine with RTX, you should 100% be using it. If you've got a machine with a good NVIDIA graphics card, you should 100% try it. Um, it. My performance is definitely not as miraculous. Like you can probably hear this, which like you definitely wouldn't have been able to if that other video is to be believed. Um, yeah, it's really exciting because setting up like the noise gates to do the background noise filtering yourself, um, where I used to stream um, was an apartment in London and we just like, we were on a main road um, and it was an absolute nightmare um, where like I had to have, I spent so long just trying to get like a bearable audio setup. So if that piece of software works, it'll be a miracle. Thank you for raising that. Cool. Hello, Mintcorn. Um, also, okay, so... Um... I was going to ask some questions about it, but let's, let's move on. Yeah. Um, all right. So Twilio did a game show. Cool. I don't know if you saw it, a quiz show on Twitch. I didn't. Um, other people are doing live coding. Uh, people are doing lecture series, uh, all sorts of things going on. Um, what does Twitch in particular lend itself to when it comes to developer relations, would you say? Great question. Um, I've spent a super long time just in my career in general obsessing about this. So for anyone watching who doesn't know me, um, basically everything that I've done in my career has been based in hackathons in one way or another. Um, and so a really early question that came up for me was like, what is the viewable form of a hackathon, right? Like hackathons are great to participate in, they there is no spectatable form of a hackathon, right? Like you can't go to a hackathon as a guest and like sit around and lurk. Maybe you come for the final demos, but like even that's kind of weird. Um, so like what is like, I guess what I was calling it was like the esportsification of uh, coding. Like we play games at home and for some reason now hundreds of thousands of people watch people play games. Like how do we get to that transition from coding? Um, and I think this is definitely something that people are struggling with, with DevRel, but also just like con like, coding content in particular. I think it takes a very particular kind of person to sit and watch and enjoy a coding live stream. Like I can't even watch video tutorials about code, um, let alone a live stream because I get like, I just want to skip through to the information I need and get out of that like content, right? I want to get back to it. Um, and in with Twitch in particular, what you see a lot of is uh, very binary activity. Either you get people who are really actively in chat, like trying to interact with the streamer and like they're donating to get them to read stuff and that kind of thing. Um, or you have people, the vast majority of people, I think my, I don't have any stats about this up, but my intuition is the vast majority of people um, have a long running stream on in the background. Twitch definitely seems to lend itself well to uh, longer running content that people can kind of jump in at any point. Um, and kind of be up to date with where they are, which obviously with live coding is again, quite difficult. Like if you jump into a coding stream halfway through, can you catch up to where they are? Um, there are some really great live coding streams. Um, Suze Hinton, uh, Noopcat, 
or no op count, I guess it would actually be. Um, her stream is fantastic. And also Suze has a really good blog post about her live streaming setup on her medium, uh, which I would really recommend uh, reading. Um, so clearly it can work, but yeah, as you said, there's definitely people experimenting with it um, and trying to make it more viewable. Um, my favorite example of this is uh, an organization called Battlesnake where they, it's kind of a hackathon, but instead of like building a generic product, you're building a AI for the game of Snake. So think like Nokia Snake, you're building an AI for a game of Snake. And then uh, basically you, you build that throughout time. And what the, the streamed portion of it is, is like televised and shout casted tournaments basically. So uh, they have a, um, like they'll have a tournament and they'll get eight of these AIs, they'll load them up. And then they will have like actual commentators coming on and commenting about uh, like the snake's behavior and what kind of things they're seeing and what what decisions the snake's AI is making. And it's really, really good. And it's like one of the closer things to a viewable coding thing I think I've ever seen. Um, but I guess all this is to say that I don't actually think there is any solved answers here yet, right? Like we haven't as an industry cracked the esportsification of technical content. Um, there are some people who want tutorials, but like following along with a Twitch tutorial is all of the worst things about workshops amplified. Like you can't be helped by the instructor. Um, you can't, there's a big delay on Twitch streams between like stuff coming up. Code in the Dark is a great example. Um, that's in the chat. Code in the Dark is another very viewable format. I haven't seen it really work on stream yet, but in person, it's a super viewable format. Um, but yeah, so like you can't really be helped by the instructor. Um, if you ask a question in chat, it's going to be like, there's a big delay between chat and live. Um, so it's not going to be answered in a useful amount of time. Um, for the instructor, there's like potentially exponential amount of people there. Um, so I think instructional live coding is probably never going to reach the numbers that we would hope it will. Um, obviously, Microsoft and Channel 9 are doing some really interesting things here and trying to make it work. And I know AWS has been doing some stuff as well. Um, but hearing Twilio doing a game show is really interesting. So I think the entertainment aspect is probably more where stuff needs to go. Um, so like Twilio used to this thing called Hacker Olympics, which was like a series of kind of technically adjacent, small technically adjacent games. Um, like use technical skills but like weren't just sitting down and coding um that kind of thing for a twitch stream like more of a game show like a technical game show is much more compelling to me than watching a live coding stream but as i said at the beginning i am one of these people who can't even watch a video i have a friend who not only watches uh sue Hinton's live stream but like actively concentrates and participates for the duration which is like multiple hours on a weekend and i cannot imagine me myself being able to engage with a live stream uh of that in that way but so i think it's there's definitely very varied audience types on this um and i think a successful channel is going to use is going to have content for that bridges these different divides yeah and and i guess um naturally in devrel anyway you'd be doing different things in person and you know you you go to conference you don't necessarily only stand on stage and speak all the time you know there's a right uh, right i think now it's, it's quite interesting because twitch feels like you know you can look at twitch and just think well it's just the same old medium that we've had for a long time right. period, but it's not it's its own thing right um for sure. i think if you go back and look at the early television broadcasts you know there'd be someone very formally dressed sitting there going hello welcome to yeah. the bbc and, and now <laughs> we feel like we understand what television is that looks really weird yeah. I think maybe we'll we'll come back and see what we're doing now with yeah. Twitch, and perhaps think some of that's weird. The, the the specifics of Twitch that you brought up there is really interesting because there's one area that I actually think is probably has really interesting short term benefits that I haven't really seen explored yet. So Twitch has a really good um, developer ecosystem that a lot of the games use. So uh, for example, uh, there is a plugin for uh, card games. So not, I'm not talking like poker and that kind of thing. I mean like trading card games like Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, Magic the Gathering, um, where if you are watching someone play one of those games um, via like a virtual version. So for, for example, like via Magic the Gathering Arena, which is a gamified version of Magic the Gathering, um, the add-on will uh, read the cards off of the stream 
and will like give you information about them. So, because when you're when you're a when you're watching that stream, the the player may be playing really quickly, and maybe a card went past, and it's got loads of text that describes what it does, and you don't get a chance to see it, and you want to know like, oh, why what was that card that player that streamer just played? Um, and so this add-on will catch that card and be like, hey, that that streamer just played this, and you can click on it. You can go like you as the person watching the stream now on Twitch can click on the stream where that card is, and it will open like more information for you within the UI. It's really cool. Um, and what's interesting is that I haven't seen a lot of uh, basically de like developers doing like development on Twitch pick up on this. So uh, the, the killer app that like has been in my mind, I hope they make is um, REPL, uh, REPL.it recently made uh, like the uh, a product to open um, any GitHub repo basically instantly within REPLit. So REPLit is like an online uh, cloud hosted dev environment, essentially. So you can go to it, you can set it up with your repo so that someone who wants to contribute to your product comes to your repo, clicks one button that's in your readme, and now they have a full dev environment ready to go and they just do what they want to do and then it gets committed. Um, like, why isn't this on Twitch? Like, why can't I go to someone's live coding stream and just straight away say like, oh, I want to like run what they're running click a button and just have their dev environment set up and ready to go, right? Like, and that's so doable with the Twitch dev ecosystem. And like, it's already things of that scale have already been done by developers <laughs> for all of these games. And like, they would instantly lift up all of this coding content and actually make it interactive and far more consumable. Um, and again, this is something that people are playing with. Um, Suze Hinton uh, on her live stream has live coded twitch apps for her stream um so I, maybe she maybe someone is there by now and i just aren't aware of it um but it's yeah it's super 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 good idea um all right it's not super good idea rather so i got distracted by chat uh super fertile territory uh i think as well in using the twitch developer ecosystem to make some of these these things that we're doing with twitch work and it's also right in the domain of like hacky stuff um that as DevRel people were all very into, like doing a Twitch API mashup with your company's product um, to add more functionality to your stream. Like, again, like to go to Twilio, like the things you could do with just integrating SMS with the Twitch functionality to like make things happen on the stream, like would be very enriching for the audience who are there. And then also actually like demonstrate the product in a cool way. So I think there's a, if you're going to be using Twitch for a dev role, definitely look at whether there's any implications from the Twitch platform uh, that and your API. What do you, so what do you reckon to um, non-Twitch platforms? You've got Mixer from Microsoft, which you know yep. is very, I guess, Xbox heavy right now, but I'm sure you could use it for other stuff. You've got yeah. um, YouTube Live, obviously. Um, the, the audiences are definitely different between between the yeah. two or the three uh platforms um yeah do you think do you think there's a critical mass with twitch enough for, and i'm talking about devrel stuff specifically sure or is it worth experimenting with with youtube live as well um i think ultimately there's no reason not to be using multiple platforms like it's it's technically trivial to rebroadcast across multiple platforms at the same time um where it gets difficult is in actually interacting with those audiences so if you're just doing like purely a i'm throwing my content out into the world i'm going to be my content will be live on this platform at x or y time um like cross streaming to all of them is like super reasonable um but then if you want to be answering chat like we're doing um or if you want to be um like if you want to do these integrations and that kind of thing, you do kind of need to pick a platform or you need to have a big moderation team who's going to be acting across all of them. Um, I don't have a lot of opinions across the platforms. Um, I ultimately think that uh, we are seeing like a arms race isn't the right word, but like, okay, so like look at Mixer, for example, like Mixer, bought a bunch of the big Twitch streamers and might like, incentivize them to change platform, right? Like I think right now there is a competitive environment that will at some point seed a winner. Like I don't think like the cloud ecosystem that all three of these platforms will continue to fight for this crown indefinitely. I think at some point one of them is going to 
and knowing Google will it will be them <laughs> who will give who will just like dump that product into the ocean. Um, but I think at one point a, a clearer answer on this will emerge. Twitch is right now the clear leader. Um, but again, uh, it's all gaming adjacent, and there has been. Um, I hope this isn't a controversial statement, but the gaming community and being adjacent to the gaming community uh, has its own perils, especially for moderation. Um, and there has been the case where like uh, a big non-gaming related uh, thing, like a coding live stream has made it to the Twitch front page and the chat has been flooded with like people who have no idea what this is. And there's been inappropriate behavior pretty quickly. So finding a quieter platform can actually have its advantages. Um, Twitch is very much there to prompt and promote discovery, but like if that's not amongst an audience that's beneficial to your business, that's not useful for you, right? So um, yeah, at the moment for coding, I don't know if there's a clear winner. Twitch has the advantage just because that's where people stream. Um, but yeah, I don't know if it makes much difference. I mean, I, I think the thing I like about YouTube, because I, I, I mean, I did, I remember when they first brought out Hangouts on there and you could... Right you know, live, live stream hangouts effectively. And we used to do that a lot in the Ubuntu world. And it wasn't a stream. It was just a live right. video. Well, yeah. And what I mean by that is there's all those cultural things that come with a strip Twitch stream weren't yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. It was just YouTube, but it happened to be happening right there and then. Um, so right. I think there are, there are benefits to that. Um, yeah. And, uh jeremy mentions you know like discord and things like that and um uh yeah i mean i i would say um we're probably coming to the point where we need to wrap up but uh, i mean is is it worth looking at um how do you how do you moderate and make sure that you have a a good participant experience for yeah live stream dev realm do you have any thoughts on that yeah absolutely um, yeah, so first of all, uh, thank you for bringing up Discord, Jeremy. Jeremy knows that I'm a big fan of Discord at the moment, precisely because uh, this is a really interesting thing. Although uh, a lot of the game gaming harbors some terrible dark pockets and corners, uh, that means that tools built for gaming have fantastic moderation, um, such as Discord and also such as Twitch. Um, so if you are going to be using Twitch, um, this just goes for any, any platform where you should be, where you expect then, well, where there is a possibility of unexpected audience interaction. So this goes for uh, just as much for Twitch as it does a conference stage, right? Like if you are hosting a conference, you should be on watch for someone heckling something inappropriate from the audience, right? Or like a speaker breaking the code of conduct, right? It's exactly the same on Twitch. Uh, you need to have active, proactive moderation who is there to watch out for like code of conduct violations, whether they are from the speaker or from the, the chat and is there to deal with it. So Twitch has really great moderation tools. You as a streamer can nominate moderators, get your colleagues in, give them the moderator permission, have them watch tw uh, Twitch. There's so many tools. You can put the chat on slow mode. You can make the chat subscriber only. So only people who have paid money um, can talk. Um, you can, there's like a bunch, so many tools there that you can use to, to calm the space down um, or to like keep it kind of productive. Um, from the host side, it's a little bit more difficult. Um, you'd have to have uh, a like voice of God, like an actual producer kind of sitting there. So if you're organizing a conference over Twitch, for example, and like you haven't checked the slides in advance for some reason, um, inexcusable reason, but maybe the slide in the last minute, um, you want to be having a, a live producer, right? Ready to cut off the video and audio stream, right? Um, who is like able to, to do that. So the person who is like emceeing or is on camera isn't also simultaneously G Twitch and doing video production. Um, so there's like content moderation is a similar scale to a live event. It's just, uh, there are more tools. It's far easier to ban someone from a Twitch chat than it is from your event. Someone says something inappropriate, straight away, drop the ban hammer on them, silence them, whatever it is, and they're out. Um, and Twitch has a new moderator view, which is, um, new since i stopped video game streaming uh so really joe cool we're, you're going a bit dalecky um oh I'm sorry worried. how's it how's it now still bad i mean i'm amazed that my laptop is even coping with this because it is 
basically running on a piece of wet string instead of a CPU. Um, so I'm going to buy a new machine. Uh, but yeah. Um, I will wait till things calm down. You're fine now. You're fine now. Great. Cool. Um, yeah. So I think we've kind of spoken enough about moderating. But yeah. Moderate. Have it. Nominate moderators. Yeah. Well, that's one of the things that... Um, <laughs> thanks, Jerry. Uh, that's one of the things that we need uh, for DevRock on Earth. And I'll segue seamlessly into that. Um, registrations are free. We're running uh, a bunch of these meetups, as we're calling them. I mean, Twitch streams, let's let's be frank, is what they are. Um, over the weeks uh, leading up to DevRock on Earth. Um, but DevRock on Earth will be effectively um, a series of Twitch streams, most likely uh, every Tuesday and Thursday for about six weeks. And you can register at 2020.devrel.net for free, um, where you will then, that's your key to get in notifications of the schedules and probably being invited to whatever back channel that we decide on, Discourse or Slack. Um, and really a lot of this is, the reason why we're doing these streams leading up is to experiment with what works well. Um, but yeah, look, Joe and everyone who um, uh, joined us in the chat, um, thank you very much. Um, it's been really nice d doing this and I'm super impressed by, uh, the fancy OBS setup we've got going. I'm really sad that <laughs> I have huge amounts of lag despite the fact, right? Listen to this. Everything is being captured on my machine. You're perfect. Even though it's still on my machine and mine's all laggy and rubbish. What, what, how's that fair? You need a, you need a separate stream machine now for you. That's, that's the answer. Get, yeah. get your Elgato HD60S going. Yep, yep. I'll be uh, burning the credit card. All yeah. right. Thank oh, you very much. That was one thing oh, about yeah. hardware I didn't say. That I just want to quickly throw in. Um, yeah. There are cheaper variants of all this hardware. This is the Elgato green screen, which is like the best made pop up banner in the world. You can get a cheap, terrible green screen from Amazon that will do the job for 15 quid. Um, same with these key lights, same with the stream cards. Uh, build up, like you'll get something that looks a little bit less than optimal initially, um, but then you can build it up really quickly and easily. Um, that, what so you've got behind you is a pop-up a pop up banner, so it's not oh, coming down yeah. from the ceiling. So we're DevRel people, right? Yeah, so it's pop-up. So we're yeah. DevRel people. We live and die by pull-up banners. Honestly, Elgato have innovated on the pull-up banner. It's like a, um, it's a scissor mechanism, so you can raise and lower it to every height. Um, it comes, it's its own carry case. So like it folds down and then like bolts up and like the stands retract. It's honestly, I want like actual conference banners made from this banner design. It's a work of art. It's right. genuinely very good. <laughs> well, the audio is going again, um, which is clearly a signal that I need to uh, get that Mac Mini I've been looking at. Um, all right. Well, um, thank you again. And thank you. Catch you all on the internet somewhere. I'm now going to do a screen transition. Goodbye. <laughs>